preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Marty Maskowitz, and on behalf of the Bronfman Center for Jewish Life, I would like to welcome you to the 92nd Street Y, and thank you for joining us for tonight's lecture, Athletes, Allegiances, and American Jewish History with Professor Jeffrey Gurok. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I'd like to take a moment to let you know about a couple of upcoming events. On April 24th, please join us for our free Yom HaShoah commemoration, Underground in Hitler's Berlin, with Barbara Levenham, Ruth Arndt Gumpel, and John Grimes. On May 10th, join us for our annual State of World Jewelry Lection, which this year will feature a screening of the film Protocols of Zion, followed by a panel discussion. Now it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's guest speaker, Professor Jeffrey Gurok. The Libby M. Clapperman Professor of Jewish History at Yeshiva University, Professor Gurok is the author or editor of 13 books, including A Modern Heretic and a Traditional Community, Mordechai M. Kaplan and Orthodoxy and American Judaism, which received the Saul Viner Prize for the American Jewish Historical Society, and most recently, Judaism's, Judaism's Encounter with American Sports, on which tonight's lecture is based. He was, he was Associate Editor of American Jewish History, a leading journal in the field, and he is a former, former chair of the Academic Council of the American Jewish Historical Society. Professor Gurok has served for the past 25 years as the assistant basketball coach at Yeshiva University and has run the New York City Marathon 12 times. As he told me earlier, he's a, I think he's run 24,000 miles to date. So, um, Professor Gorok will be available after tonight's uh, presentation to autograph copies of his book, which are available for purchase at the back. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Jeffrey Gorok. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. Uh, this is a bit of a homecoming of sorts for me. Um, I got my first trophy as a kid in the Y program. Uh, my son played five or six years ago on the Y Maccabee R basketball team. And most importantly, my dad wrestled for the Y some 70 years ago. And we'll say more about my father's experiences at the Y in a few moments. We had an heirloom, which unfortunately was lost when my parents passed away. We had in our possession a purloined towel from the New York Athletic Club which was stolen by my father when the Y wrestled against the New York AC in the 1930s, which was as close as a Jew could get to the New York AC during that time period. And that's one of my themes of my talk, how we use American Jewish history themes and sports themes intersect to understand where we are as a people, past, present, and future. When most people think about books about Jews and sports, two images come to mind. First is the scene in 1980 movie Airplane, where a passenger gets on the plane and the flight attendant walks by and offers that person a very small pamphlet, great Jewish sports heroes. The other metaphor that's normally talked about are these large encyclopedias of Jews and sports, which make every effort to enumerate every possible Jew who ever played sports in the United States. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't mention some of them before getting on to the bulk of my talk. In basketball, one of my favorite sports, of course you have Nat Holman, who besides coaching at City College of New York was an athletic director here at the Y. He produced eight Jewish All-Americans. He played for the original Celtics. The three great Reds of basketball, Red Auerbach of the Celtics, Red Holtzman, if you go to the garden where they used to have professional basketball, you will see in the rafters Holtzman 613, which corresponds to the number of mitzvot in the Torah, and Red Saracek, who was a longtime coach of Yeshiva Maccabees, the team that I coach uh, today. Adolf Shays, Dolph Shays, was the all-time leading scorer in the NBA before Will Chamberlain. I had the, the pleasure of meeting Dolph a few months ago. 
up in Syracuse on tour. The day before I went to Syracuse, I was in the synagogue, and someone asked me, what are you doing tomorrow? I said, I'm going to Syracuse, and I'm told Dolph Shays is coming to my lecture. So this younger guy said, Dolph Shays, is that Danny Shays' uh, father, you know? So I went up there and I said to Dolph, I want you to know how you're being remembered today. You're being remembered as Dan Shays' father. And I think you should feel very good about it. I wasn't sure how would he react, but his wife gave me a kiss, so I think it did okay on that score. When I was a kid, Barry Kramer, Art Heyman, uh, Ernie Grunfeld, in the spirit of blatant self-promotion, let me tell you that I'm involved in a documentary film that's coming out in the fall. It's called The First Basket, which profiles the life and times of a Jewish basketball player named Ozzy Sheckman, who went to Tilden High School, LRU, went into the service. When he came out in 1946, played in the BAA, the forerunner of the NBA, and scored the first basket in its history. And I'm, in the, I'm actually in the movie, besides being a consultant. I'm in the movie for 17 seconds. So when the show comes out, get your TiVo ready and record it like I do and play it back and forth all night. That's Ozzy Sheckman. On the distaff, distaff side, of course, Nancy Lieberman, one of the great female basketball players involved with the Women's National Basketball Association. In baseball, Greenberg, Koufax, Bloomberg, Euclid, Green, Kapler, Stern, Ausmus, Jason Marquis, Liebethal. All these names are great names in baseball. We'll say more about Koufax and Greenberg in a few moments. In figure skating, Sasha Cohen, Sarah and Emily Hughes are Jews. In boxing, in the 1920s, there were 17 world champions who were Jews. In track and field, Marty Glickman and Sam Stoller, about I'll have more to say later on. And speaking of marathons, no person in New York City history, in recent history, did more to bring all the ethnic and racial groups together on one brilliant Sunday every year, Fred LeBeau in the New York City Marathon, also part of our people. Today there is a magazine called Jewish Sports Review, which tries to enumerate every possible Jewish athlete. Now I should warn you about these books and these pamphlets, that they're rife with errors, and sometimes non-Jews find their way into these books which leads to the following true life autobiographical tale. When I was a college student at City College of New York in the 1960s, I played lacrosse. Now lacrosse is basketball with fouling permitted. And my coach at that point was a man named George Barron, who was a first team all American goalie and important for the story of Ukrainian American extraction, decidedly not a Jew, although he grew up on the Lower East Side, on Avenue A in the Ukrainian section of downtown. So I take you now to an actual scene in the locker room at halftime at Lewiston Stadium of Blessed Memory in the midst of another less than stellar performance by yours truly. George Barron turns to me and says, Gurak, there's this encyclopedia of Jews and sports. I'm in it, you're never gonna be in it. Now how did George Barron get into the book? The authors assumes, the editors assume that a man named George Barron who went to City College in the 40s, was coaching in the 60s, had to be Jewish. So you gotta be very careful with some of these books. Why were these books done? It was the functional equivalent of Jews searching out to prove that Christopher Columbus was Jewish, or that Chaim Solomon stipended the American Revolution. It was a search for showing that we're true Americans because we play American sports. But I'm a professional historian, and I'm out for much bigger game. And I want to use sports as a way of understanding where Jews are and have been as a people. And to tell you the truth, Marty was kind enough to mention that uh, over the course of my career, this is my lucky 13th book. Um, and I've written on very many different topics in American Jewish history, including about Mordechai Kaplan, who, by the way, worked here at this Y. When I turned 50, I said to myself, you know what? I have to have the guts to write a book about sports. You see, in the field of, Amer of Jewish studies, American Jewish historians are the Rodney Dangerfields within, the, within this discipline. People don't give us respect, or enough respect. Too many people dismissive of what we do. We don't study great rabbis, we don't study the Talmud, we don't study rabbinic codes, etc. But as a point of academic faith, to understand the immigrant experience, it's important to know how Jews eat and how Jews dress and how Jews play. It's a basic part of understanding the immigrant experience of adjustment to America. So in my book, 
I address the question of intergenerational conflict played out on the field. Kids come home from the gym. Kids come home from the street and they tell their parents they're greenhorns. They don't understand America because they don't speak the American language. They don't understand American music or American theater. And they don't understand American games. And one of the things that interested me is how kids slip away from their parents and play sports and their parents' lack of recognition of what this is all about. In doing this book, I interviewed an, inter an elderly Jew named Sid Gerchik, who grew up in Brooklyn. Growing up, he thought his first name was get a job and his last name, you bum, because his mother kept saying, get a job, you bum. What are you doing going out and playing sports all the time? <clears throat> My own father, who I mentioned a moment ago, when he wrestled at the Y, wrestled under an assumed name of Jack Austin, not Jack Gurak, because he didn't want his mother to know that he was becoming a bum and wrestling in the Y. Why he chose Jack Austin, we do not know. But I'm told today, <coughs> excuse me, in professional wrestling, there's someone out there named Stone Cold Steel Austin, same last name. Want you to know he is not a relative of mine, even though he's involved in the same game as wrestling. While on tour this year, I spoke in Pittsburgh, and this isn't in the book, but I'll share it with you. And in the Q&A afterwards, an elderly gentleman got up and said that growing up in Pittsburgh, his father was an Orthodox rabbi, and there was no yeshiva in Pittsburgh at that point. So he went to the public school, and he was very tall, still very tall, and he went out for the basketball team with the understanding from his mother that the games would be Tuesday and Friday afternoon, he would be home before the Sabbath. So you know what happens. One of the games goes into triple overtime, and he comes in late, and it's almost sundown. And to make the story even more robust, his father has a heart condition, let's add that. And his father excoriates his son, screaming, carrying on. His father finally calms down and says, oh, by the way, did you win? And he said for him, that was the turning point in his father's experience. He understood the, va understood the values of American sports. Speaking of values, religious values, in Jewish tradition, the ideal male is Jacob, Yaakov. Although Jacob does have a wrestling sequence in his life, he wrestles with a, a stranger with an angel, Jewish tradition says that he is a sedentary figure. He, in Hebrew we say, Yoshev o Halim, he sits by on the sidelines as opposed to his brother Esau. Esau is Ish HaSadeh, the man of the fields in contemporary parlance. You know who Esau would be? He would be the star right fielder on steroids. That's how Jewish tradition understands Esau. And yet, it's interesting in America, the integration of what becomes known as the pool with the shul. In other words, using the interests kids have in athletics as a hook to bring them into religious life. And how do you do it? The complexity of doing that is one of the issues that I deal with uh, in the book. Those who come to play, hopefully you can make them interested in staying to pray. Speaking of intergenerational conflict and the mediation between generations, greater historians than I have often written about Abraham Kahan. Abraham Kahan, the very famous editor of the Jewish Daily Forward. Some of you may know of him as the columnist who did a bintel brief, Letters to the Editor column, where Kahan talks about all aspects of immigrant adjustment to America. Well, there are also sports sequences to his life in two regards. First, in April 1909, he publishes on the front page of the Forward at the beginning of the baseball season a schematic diagram of a baseball diamond. Why? To teach parents about this crazy game that's captivating the youngsters. And there even is a bintel brief question where a Jew writes to Kahan and says, my kid is all agog about baseball. Is it permissible? Should we encourage our kids, let our kids play baseball? So Kahan writes back in a, in a beautiful way. He says, you know what? Chess is preferable to these sports. That skills the mind. But baseball is OK. It makes you strong and resolute and a good American. However, he's not so sure about football. 
Although there were some great football players, Marshall Goldberg passed away recently, a great football player in Pittsburgh, this is not a sport for Jews. So again, using all these metaphors, we can talk a little bit about how Jews live their lives and how they adjusted to America during the immigrant period. It's all, sports can also be a way of understanding where we are as a community today. And in my remaining moments, I want to talk about questions of Jewish acceptance, integration, and competition within the contemporary Jewish community. And to do this, I'd like you to accept for a moment the following basic axiom about modern society and, and minority groups that was taught to me at Columbia some 30 years ago by a great African-American historian, the late Nathan I. Huggins. He always used to say, for minority groups, wars and sports define society. If you want to know how a minority group is doing in a community, see whether it's allowed to play or fight for its community. Now, for Huggins, obviously, the metaphor was the admission of Jack Roosevelt Robinson into the major leagues two years before Harry S. Truman desegregated totally the armed forces of the United States. The same metaphor can be used for Jews. Although our experience is far better than that of African Americans, the questions of acceptance and non-acceptance of Jews both in this country and elsewhere can be played out through the sports experience. To give you two examples, first, the 1936 Olympics. When I was growing up as a kid, I thought that Marty Glickman was simply the histrionic and great announcer who used to broadcast the football giants and the Knicks on radio. And I remember once as a kid, the Giants in the 60s, the Giants were playing against the Minnesota Vikings, and they were down 18 points in the fourth quarter. And the Giants scored one touchdown, and they scored two touchdowns, and they were driving for the, what proved to be the winning touchdown when the two-minute warning occurred. And Glickman said, if you're within the sound of my voice, and you're driving in a car, pull off the road. I don't want to cause any accidents. And a friend of mine was driving on the Sawmill River Parkway, and he saw cars pulling off the road because of Glickman's histrionic calls of the game. But as you well know, <clears throat> Marty Glickman is a very important figure in, in modern Jewish history, in 20th century Jewish history. Because in 1936 at Hitler's games, Avery Brundage, remember this name, Avery Brundage, the head of the US Olympic Committee, doesn't want to embarrass Adolf Hitler by seeing a Jew win, be part of the relay race, the four by 100 meter race, one of the signature events of the Olympics. Now there were Jews in the Olympics, there were Jews on the basketball team. Actually, there were three Jews, Jules Bender, Ben Kramer, and Erwin Klein on the basketball team. But no one followed basketball back then. In fact, the game was played not on a wood floor, but on a dirt floor, and it rained before the final game. It wasn't much of a ball game. But Brundage doesn't want to embarrass Hitler by having a Jew on that victory stand in front of 100,000 fans. Now, interestingly enough, as you know, Jesse Owens runs. He wins four gold medals. And when the Olympic team comes back to the United States and they're feted at the Waldorf Astoria, Owens is allowed to be part of that banquet. But to get to the main ballroom, he has to go up the back elevator. That's the metaphor of acceptance and non-acceptance. So if you want to see where Jews are in the world in 1936, in a pre-Holocaust story, look at the sports experience, look at the Berlin Olympics. And you know where I'm going because 36 years later, the games return to Germany. The serene games come to Munich, and 11 Israeli athletes are murdered by Palestinian terrorists. And the metaphor is, this happens in 1972. A year later, 1973, another international organization down the block from us called the United Nations defines Zionism as coterminous with racism. Wars and sports, this is very serious business. And to fast forward to contemporary times, did you know that at the 2004 games, an Iranian athlete was paid $25,000 by his government for refusing to wrestle against an Israeli? Again, the metaphor of sports defining community on the world scene is played out here. Less dramatically, this June, the World Cup will take place. 
Israel is geographically located in the Middle East, where I last looked, but they play in the European bracket. Geopolitical ramifications played out through the, the sports metaphor. The second example of Jewish acceptance and non-acceptance is, of course, the story of Hank Greenberg and the 1934 World Series. Many people have commented on that. Please listen to my version. You know that no matter whether Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are early or late, there's going to be a conflict between the High Holy Days and the end of the baseball season. In fact, today, when the postseason baseball runs almost a month, if there are Yankee fans in the audience like myself, what have we been saying for years? We have to win 11 games in October, right? Okay, 11 games in October. There's always going to be a conflict between the High Holy Days and playing uh, baseball. In 1934, Hank Greenberg is the greatest Jewish player of his time. The question is, would he play on Rosh Hashanah? And he's pressured severely to play on those days. In fact, his manager, Mickey Cochran, says to him, it is your civic obligation to play for Detroit, as if Detroit is under attack by the evil empire from New York called the New York Yankees. He doesn't know what to do. He turns to a reform rabbi named Leo Franklin, very famous rabbi who had gone one-on-one, -on -one, you'll excuse the expression, against Henry Ford some 10 years earlier. He asked Franklin what should he do. Franklin offers this very intriguing answer. He says, first of all, it's your decision to make, my son, but search your soul and ask yourself, why are you playing? If you're playing because it's your job, then you really shouldn't play. But if you're playing because you're playing for your community, not Jewish community, but Detroit community, then you might consider playing. And in fact, Greenberg plays on Rosh Hashanah. Nine days later, <clears throat> God is good, and the magic number has been reduced to three. Excuse me. Greenberg sits out on Yom Kippur, walks into the congregation, Chari, it's a standing ovation from the Jews in the synagogue. My point, if you want to see where Detroit juries at 1934 in a community that knows the Ku Klux Klan and Father Coughlin and Henry Ford, look at the sports metaphor. We now fast forward to 1965. Sandy Koufax, as you well know, is the greatest Jewish player of his era. He decides that he's not going to play on Yom Kippur. And in a more cultural, pluralistic America, they understand that a Jew might want to take off his holiest day, and he does not pitch. His roommate, Don Drysdale, pitches. And for those of you who like the economics of sports, do you remember when Drysdale and Koufax held out together for $100,000? Let's be honest, A-Rod gets $100,000 every time he hits into a double play in the fifth game of the championship series. I'm not too bitter about that in October, but that's the reality. So Drysdale pitches instead of Koufax and Drysdale pitches horribly. And as he's taken out of the game by Walt Alston, Drysdale says, again, these immortal words of Jewish history. He says, Skip, I bet today you wish I was also a Jew. Because if, if he was a Jew, he wouldn't be playing on uh, Yom Kippur. To be honest with you, I've given this speech before. And recently, someone in the Q&A told me a, a great uh, addition to this Namely, you know this game, Trivial Pursuit? There is a Trivial Pursuit card that relates to this saga. The question is, what did Walt Alston take off his desk after the 1966 season? The answer, a Jewish calendar. Again, 1965, Jews are more accepted in a cultural pluralistic America, and uh, Colfax decides not to play. So how are Jews doing today? Listen. There's a Louis Farrakhan out there. There are 11 skinheads in Wyoming. And anti-Semitism exists overseas, particularly in France, former Soviet Union, Argentina, and of course, we're concerned always for the fate of our brethren in the state of Israel. Having said that, these are heady times for Jews in America. 
Social discrimination is over. Corporations, banks, law firms all have Jews in inner offices. Ivy League schools are inundated with Jews. We lost one college president a couple weeks ago, but that wasn't due to anti-Semitism. Hotels, resorts love Jews. Another family saga. Before my dad went into the Navy in 1942, he and my mother went on a vacation to New Hampshire in the height of the off season, they hadn't taken down the no Jews, dogs, or consumptive signs. I've never experienced that in my 56 years of life. And America loves diversity. Six years ago, an Orthodox Jew almost became Vice President of the United States. And this good news is reflected in the Jewish sports experience as well. To give you a number of examples, to finish the High Holy Day story, in 1986, the, that's the Bill Buckner World Series, the Mets are in the league championship series against the Houston Astros. There are no Jews on the Mets. There are no Jews on the Astros, although some of the owners of the Mets are Jews. Jews of New York have the chutzpah or the sense of belonging or the sense of entitlement to demand that the games themselves be canceled on Yom Kippur. And George Vesey, writing the New York Times, an op-ed peach, predicted that the Almighty would intervene. There would be no game on Yom Kippur. He predicted tremendous thunderstorms, rain. The game would be rained out. He advised fans to prepare by building arcs for that occasion. Now, at the end of the day, the game did take place because the almighty dollar of baseball takes precedence over everything. But look how far we've come as a community in 1986 to say that Yom Kippur should be recognized as, as holy as a civic holiday as the night before Christmas. If you follow the NFL playoffs, they always start the games early so the game will be over before sundown in almost all cases. Interestingly enough, Two years before he died, a great American, a great New Yorker, a great Catholic, and a good friend of the Jews, John Cardinal O'Connor, made a proclamation in which he said there should be no games on Easter Sunday, and he admonished Catholic kids not to play on their holiest day, Good Friday. And maybe he learned this from his friends, the Jews, uh, at that point in time. So we've come a long way since 1934 and even 1965. A second example. I mentioned the forward as a source with Abraham Kahan. Well, a few years ago, an Orthodox Jew from Seattle, and it's recorded in my book, came to New York and decided to take a, in a baseball game, Yankee Stadium. And to make it worse, he decides he's going to sit in the right field bleachers among the bleacher creatures. And he raises the question, which of the following two symbols should he wear, a yarmulke or a Seattle baseball cap? Which one of the two would get him in more trouble with the fans? He thinks it over. He says, at the end of the day, I'm more an Orthodox Jew than a Seattle baseball fan. He sits, as he says, in blissful anonymity for nine innings. Nobody says a word to him. No one refers to his yarmulke as a Yamaha. No one bugs him. He notices a few steps away, there's a kid, looks like a Christian kid, wearing a Seattle baseball cap. People are throwing peanuts and beer and soda on the kid. He says, you got to believe. If you believe in the home team, you can sit like anyone else in the stands. And if he were hungry, he could go up the right field line and order a hot dog, a knish, and a beer, albeit kosher, and sit in the, sit in the stands like everyone else. Uh, Marty was kind enough to mention that I've had the privilege over the last 25 years of coaching uh, Yeshiva University's basketball team as an assistant coach. So I have a story that relates to this. Uh, some of our kids wear yarmulkes when they play. Now there's a rule in basketball that says you can't wear any jewelry. You know Bobby Bonds wears all this necklace stuff. You can't wear that in basketball. You can get your finger, your, your, your finger caught in the rim, all sorts of things. But it's understood that you can wear a yarmulke if you want when you play. So we go out to play against Drew University a few years ago. It's a Methodist school in Madison, New Jersey. And we start warming up and some of our kids are wearing yarmulkes. The referee comes out, one of the refs says, they got to take those things off. So we, the coaches, say, fine, we're going back to Washington Heights. The drill coach says, what are you talking about? They've been wearing those things for 40 years. 
Now, for the record, we've been wearing yarmulkes more than 40 years. We've been playing Drew for 40 years, but be that as it may, the referee is adamant. They've got to take those things off. Again, we tell our kids, put your sweats on. We're going back to Washington Heights. In total frustration, the Drew coach takes us and the referee back in the back room, gets on the phone, gets the director of officials from the ECAC on the phone, and poses the question. The official says, put the referee on the phone. He says, you dirty so-and-so. They've been wearing those things for 40 years. Let them play the game. Game starts, we lose by 29 points. On the way back to Washington Heights, one of the kids walks up to me and says, coach, we should have gotten out of town while we had a chance. But of course, the kid was wrong because we had made a very important statement. There's a guy out there now, a welterweight, who's moving up in the welterweight ranks named Dmitry Salita. He's a Russian Jewish emigre, and he's involved with the Lubavitch Hasidim, and he will not fight any of his fights on the Sabbath. Uh, his manager is Bob Aram, who's also a Jew. Some of his idiosyncrasies don't wash well with his trainer, Jimmy O'Farrell, who has said about Salita's interest in eating kosher food. Quote, this is what O'Farrell has said. Why do you need to eat food off a certain kind of plate? Why meat go, don't go along with cream? Everyone eats it. It's going the same place when it comes out. And in New York, it's all going into the Hudson River. In any event, Dimitri Salita, was fighting a few years ago at the Mandalay Bay Hotel in Sin City, Las Vegas. He wouldn't go into the ring until the Sabbath was over, and you had one of the most incongruous events in boxing history where they had to have the last service, that's the service which ends the Sabbath, in his locker room before he went out to fight. Such is the diversity that we see in America. A final example, there's a kid He's a teenager now, living in Boston, named Mika Golgerazian. And I've been talking about him all over the country. Here's his story. A conservative Jew, an observant Jew, he was on the Worcester, Massachusetts Little League baseball team in the 2002 World Series in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. Being a Sabbath observer, he decided, and his family decided, they wanted to play the game, but not to violate the Sabbath. So the family rented a room in a hotel, in a motel, within walking distance of the stadium. He walks to the stadium, he waits in the dugout until the Sabbath is over. But that's not the story. The story is that the game was on ESPN television, broadcast around the country and really around the world. They were so intrigued with Mika that in the top right-hand corner of the screen, they superimposed a countdown clock till 8.43. You may recall before the presidential uh, debates last year, they had a countdown clock. 8.43 arrived, Micah got into the game, he was erased at second base, that's not the story. From being weird, he's being seen as idiosyncratic, interesting, and someone sort of like a Joe Lieberman in, in, that, in that regard. So all these things suggest that contemporary times are a time for great celebration by American Jews. However, it's also a time, you'll excuse the expression, for a seventh inning fetch on our part, because American decency, rather than American bias, now challenges American Jews. This edge of unfriendliness that kept Jew from Gentile as an un unconsciously to some extent in a host society has come to an end. And whereas the American population is overwhelmingly religious, the Jewish community is not. And we see this in the Jewish sports encounter as well. What I call the cult of Little League. Jewish kids do not want to be left out. In doing my research, I spoke to rabbis all over the country and I asked them about the primacy families place on sports as opposed to Jewish identification, Jewish education. And I spoke to Harold Kushner. You know Harold, Rabbi Harold Kushner, where bad things happen to good people? Well, here's bad things happening to a good community. He wrote to me that he gave a lecture, he gave a sermon on Hanukkah. By the way, Hanukkah is the first Jewish sports experience historically. And he told his congregation, maybe the Maccabees had lost the war. 
because the gymnasium is triumphing over the synagogue and our kids are opting for Little League and youth soccer over religious education. And then I spoke to Rabbi Moshe Waldux. He's the editor of a book called The Big Jewish Book of Humor. And this one is not as humorous. The first day every year of religious school, he calls in all the parents and he asks them, well, how many of you parents want your kids to be professional soccer players? A few hands go up, almost in jest. He says, if that's the case, move to Brazil or Romania. Now, how many of you people want your kids to be Jewish? All the hands go up. So why does soccer take precedence over um, religious school? And then I surf the net. And there, I don't know if there are any rabbis in this audience, but rabbis put their sermons on the net the way rabbis used to publish their sermons in newspapers. And people like me read these sermons and find some very interesting tales. There's a rabbi in Potomac, Maryland, named Rabbi Stuart Weinblatt. And sermons are very important sources in Jewish history throughout the ages. We use sources as a way of, un sermons as a way of understanding where a Jewish community is at. So here are two sermons that he delivers. Rosh Hashanah 2001. Weinblatt tells his congregation in no uncertain terms that they are capitulating to their youngsters by, he writes, in the large scheme of things, ask yourself, is Little League or soccer, or even an exam, more important than the eternal binding covenant for which many of our ancestors gave their lives to preserve? That's how rabbis talk. A year and nine days later, Yom Kippur of 2002. He rises in his pulpit and admits the following to his congregation. That nine days earlier, Rosh Hashanah 2002, he was walking with his son to synagogue. A father and son walking together, almost like the Torah reading of Abraham and Isaac on Rosh Hashanah. And this is the son of the rabbi, who's a day school kid, who studied in Israel, and son says to his father, can I play football with my friends this afternoon? Father, the rabbi says, what are you talking about? It's Rosh Hashanah. Moreover, you're the son of the rabbi. What sort of role model are you to other kids? Under no circumstances can you play on Rosh Hashanah. Father and son work further. Rabbi Weinblatt assumes his message has gotten through. And then Norm speaks up and says, OK, if I can't play football, my friends, what's your feeling about my playing basketball with my friends this afternoon. He realizes, the rabbi, that this is a problem which we all face. Parents, he says, who would not dream of missing kickoff or the final seconds of a Redskin game don't give a second thought to coming to services late. And parents who never dream of missing a kid's soccer practice don't give a second thought to dropping their kids off at Saturday morning services and they're going on on their merry way. You see, generations ago, kids slipped away from their parents. Today, their elders are unindictable co-conspirators against Jewish identity as they carpool their youngsters to events and constitute the largest part of a cheering section. Now, to be sure, in some communities, there are kosher little leagues. In fact, in Riverdale, where I live, there's even an orthodox feminist little league. It's gone that far. And in Boston, there is a Solomon Schechter little league, soccer little league. Solomon Schechter, the founder of the conservative movement, is known in sports term for the most famous epigram about rabbis in sports. He was walking one day during the World Series with his prize student, Louis Finkelstein, who would later on succeed him at the seminary. He turned to Finkelstein and said, do you know baseball or do you play baseball? And he says, unless you can play baseball, you can never be a real rabbi in America. That's that shul with a pool phenomenon. But frankly, all these leagues are more prophylactic than palliative. They're keeping people who are already observant from falling off the track, so to speak, as this irresistible force of sports impacts upon youngsters. So where are we as a community? Um, I'm reminded of what the great uh, British humorist George Bernard Shaw once said about the two worst, what are the two worst things in life? The first is not getting what you want, and the second is getting what you want. To a great extent, 
uh, our times as Jews are times for great celebration. We have gotten what we want. The problems of Jews, namely the anomalous position of Jews in society, has been largely solved. But with it come the problems of Judaism continuing in a robust way to the present day. I opened this talk by mentioning a man named George Barron. Well, there was another man in my life, same spelling, different pronunciation, Sailor Baron, who was the greatest Jewish historian of the 20th century, who once characterized the American Jewish experience as an experience of Jews being steeled, S-T-E-E-L-E-D, by adversity. And when asked, what is the adversity? He said, the adversity is the adversity of freedom. How can we live as an ongoing and vibrant community in a country which thankfully accepts us? That's what we deal with today, all seen through a very unusual, I would argue useful metaphor, namely Judaism's encounter with American sports. Thank you very much. The floor is open for questions, comments. Ma'am? Well, at the end of the day, he does stay out on Yom Kippur, okay? And, and I think the important thing is how his act is received by the Jewish community. Greenberg, notwithstanding the fact that he does marry out, is lionized for many, many, for almost generations for this act of staying out on Yom Kippur. In fact, um, I think it's a good movie. One of my problems with the film, to be totally candid with you, is that um, some of the talking heads in the film talk about the significance of Greenberg in 1934 when they were in diapers and not born yet in the 1950s, which only suggests that the Greenberg saga resonated with American Jews for the longest time. By the way, there's a distaff counterpart to, to Greenberg, not in the world of sports, but after World War II, when Bess Meyerson was, becomes Miss America, one of my colleagues writing a book about post-war American Jewish life says two symbols. Hank Greenberg, this strong and powerful and successful Jewish athlete, and Bess Meyerson, this beautiful Jewish woman who wins within America. So Greenberg looms large. The other semi-autobiographical piece is that my mother claimed that she played handball with Hank Greenberg when they grew up in the Bronx. So I come from good athletic stock. <laughs> Sir. Well, it's interesting that... Um, Whatever those strengths may be. Kind of yes, okay. There was a time when basketball was described by a lot of people, friends and foes of Jews of like, as being a particularly... Jews had particular acumen for basketball. There was a writer, I think he was for the Post or the Daily News in the 1930s, named Paul Calico, who wrote that Jews, by nature of their mentality, being shifty, being devious, had a way of playing basketball, you know, going back door, moving without the ball, all this fit into a Jewish uh, mode. Uh, on this film, you'll hear that the first basket, you'll hear me saying that if um, baseball evokes a pastoral, a rural image, and football represents the military industrial complex, bombs and game plans and the like, what's the metaphor of basketball? The the sweatshop, to produce the most perfect garment, what do you need? You need five or six people, five people working together, each one playing their own role in order to, protect, to uh, produce the, the perfect garment. Now, there was a time when Jews were, pre, were significant within basketball, had a lot to do with basketball. Again, being an urban sport, Jews being an urban people, in this country, learning basketball in the settlement houses and the like, as opposed to football, where you need a gridiron, you need open fields and baseball and the like. Basketball had a significant number of Jews in the early NBA and the like. It's changed. 
It's changed having to do with issues of mobility. You know, when I drive home from school, I tell my audiences all the time, up Washington Heights, and it's 12 degrees outside, and there's a black and Hispanic kid shooting boom, 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 boom all day, okay? That's how you become great. Jewish players had a different desire level. Now, Mark Spitz succeeds in swimming where his father could not, having something to do with uh, swim clubs and the like. We should expect to see Jews more involved in golf and tennis, reflecting our own mobility. There's nothing, notwithstanding Calico's understanding of Jews, much, much of these things are reflected in the socioeconomic status that you have. Again, there were 17 Jewish boxing champions in a time where Jews, you know, to move up economically, were agreeable to getting hit in the face. Dmitry Solita is an immigrant. And that's one of the ways that he is, uh, he's earning his living. I got to tell you one other story about Salita. I went to my first and last boxing match a few months ago at Manhattan Center. The reason it's my last boxing match is because one of his managers invited me and I sat in the second row and I could actually realize, notwithstanding what you see on TV, how hard these guys are getting hit. So Salita is orthodox. So how do you know it's orthodox at the, in the boxing ring? Number one, all the food was kosher. It was unedible but it was kosher. Secondly, the girls who walk around normally in bikinis with the, with the ring numbers, instead of bikinis, were wearing evening dresses. It was a bizarre scene, and there is this Jewish reggae musician named Matis Yahu. His music led Salita into the ring. Very strange moment, but he's an immigrant, and immigrant Jew, re-evoking that image that we had uh, of the Jewish fighters of the past. Sir? Isn't it an irony that, you know, we, we use or, or celebrate people like Koufax or Greenberg, uh, but they didn't have any Jewish, they, they, they really broke away from the Jewish tradition, and they didn't have any identity. Uh, Bar Barney Ross, I once read, was an exception. The fighter you're talking about mm -hmm. is an exception. Most of them had no Jewish identity. Most of them were, in their time, really rebels. Away from the Jewish experience and uh, really assimilate themselves, and yet, ironically, when they become heroes and well known, then uh, their fellow Jews want to adopt them and celebrate. Well, I think Jews want to adopt them because there's a great desire through sports for Jews to evidence that they are to use a Teddy Roosevelt term, manly and womanly in the American sense. So when someone like that appears on the scene, we're very, we're very proud of them in, uh, crossing all, de all Jewish denominational lines. And the other piece of the story that I mentioned in the book, which I really didn't touch on here, is that in fact, to be a great sports champion requires a certain degree of commitment that will transcend religious, religious commitments. I'll give you an example, again, I didn't go into my talk, but it is in the book, chapter 5, page 112, where in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s in Brooklyn, there were all sorts of synagogue center leagues and Jewish community center leagues. Union Temple had a team, Flatbush Jewish Center had a team, Brooklyn Jewish Center, they all played against one another. And I was able to track down some of the athletes who played on those teams. Now, the goal of these Jewish centers synagogue centers was, remember, come to play, stay to pray. So I asked these fellows, did you ever do what I call the Jewish crossover dribble, come to play, stay to pray? And the response was, listen, we were quasi-professional athletes. Sometimes we were paid under the table, but even if we weren't, we went to every possible game because we knew this was top flight competition. We went for two reasons. One, to play against the other great players. And secondly, to stay for the dance afterwards to pick up girls, pick up Jewish girls. That was part of the culture of that time. So their commitment to athletics, oh, by the way, they drew many, many fans, many of whom did stay to, stay to pray. But a certain level of commitment, this is part of this, the assimilatory uh, uh, process that we go through. My point is that levels of acceptance of Jews have gotten much better. But again, to, unless you're a fighter, see, a boxer has a bit of an advantage because 
in a way, he can choose the night that he fights. But to be a professional athlete requires a certain degree of commitment. By the way, I'm rambling on with some other examples that aren't in the book because the story keeps continuing. A year ago, um, Los Angeles Dodgers helped me. Sean Green. Sean Green had the same dilemma. Right? Sean Green. What did he decide? The Dodgers told Sh Sean Green playing for the Dodgers can't decide whether to play on Yom Kippur or not, right? The Dodger reaction in typical Dodger tradition, going back to Colfax, says, Sean, this is your decision. Leave us alone. We don't want to get involved in it. And I say, by the way, they don't want to get involved because they are sensitive, understandably, about negative publicity. So Sean Green can't decide what to do. A year earlier, he had evoked Koufax's memory and said, I'm sitting out. But the pennant race was so strong. And he wanted to be one of the guys. He wanted to be one of the players. So he came up with an interesting syncretistic solution. He played Yom Kippur Kol Nidre night and sat out Yom Kippur day. And what happened to him was like the reverse of the old joke about the rabbi who plays golf on Yom Kippur. You know that joke, rabbi plays golf on Yom Kippur, hits a hole in one, the angels say to the Almighty, why let him do it? Well, who can he tell, right? <laughs> he had two home runs Kol Nidre night. God didn't punish him. In some way, God didn't get involved in the 1986 World Series. But look, there's the metaphor. Jewish player wants to be accepted, wants to be part of the team. Competing allegiances. Uh, and that's part of the dilemma of our times. And it's not only sports. Sports is my story. It's theater, it's music, it's a variety of other social disciplines that Jews find themselves involved with. Gentlemen. Funny you should mention a very thin book. When I was in junior high school hundreds of years ago, there was a book, famous Jewish sports hero. Mm -hmm. And they even had to reach into both. Right. Uh, Frank. Oh, f oh, no, I'm sorry. Franklin was, was Franklin right, right. Was they also had Sammy Rashevsky in the book as a chess, chess master. Yeah. yeah, he didn't, yeah, yeah. yeah. right, right. Sure. Right. There, there's a, there are a panoply of these books. There's a book by Robert Slater, a great, great Jewish sports heroes very angry at him. He sells far more books than I do. It's a great bar mitzvah gift, his book. So is mine, by the way. But in any event, why are these books, why are these books come into existence? I'm suggesting they are part of an apologetic literature. Again, I, I just said quickly in passing to get started. It's the same story as Jewish war veterans trying to list how many Jews fought and died for this country. By the way, every Jew who fought and died for this country should be memorialized. But the great demand to have these compendia to list every Jew in the Civil War, Revolutionary War, and the like is reflective of a insecurity that we have to show, produce this document to say, you know, we're as American as anyone else. Wars and sports define community. Nathan Huglins was right. Gentlemen, then I'll get back. Yes. Is there any uh, comment that the commissioner is a Jewish and the owner is a Jewish? But you don't hear much talk about that. Uh, there, there is another slice to the story that it really isn't part of my book, because my book is about Judaism in sports. But there's an entrepreneurial history of Jews, Jewish involvement in sports that goes all the way back to in Major League Baseball, there's a Dreyfus uh, and boxing and a variety of other types of sports. Um, interestingly enough, that sort of involvement has been grist for some anti-Semitic mills. Two examples. One, Henry Ford, obviously no friend of Jews, and he didn't go into this anti-Semitic part of his life. Uh, Marty was, interesting enough, you're having a program here on the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Okay. So the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, the Tsarist forgery, comes to the United States in 1919, and Henry Ford trans has a translation published in the Dearborn Independent. I'll get to my point in a second. I'll get to it right now. He says Jews, the Protocols say that Jews control amusements and recreations, Jews, and Jews don't play. Jews control, they own, and ultimately they pervert. 
referring to the 1919 Black Sox scandal. Were Jews involved in the Black Sox scandal? Yes. Were Gentiles involved in the Black Sox scandal? Yes. Whole business there. So there's an example where Jewish entrepreneurship is twisted. The other example is somewhat bizarre. Ted Turner of the Braves and the Thrashers and the Hawks and CNN has real ambivalence about Jews. On the one hand, some of his top executives are Jews. On the other hand, it has been documented when the first player strike took place in the early 1970s, he said that it was the Jewish, the Jewish agents who were involved in this type of activity. So two points. Number one, it is grist for anti-Semitic mills. The other piece is it's part of Jewish entrepreneurial history in the same way that Jews went into motion pictures, in the same way that Jews went into uh, radio and television. Uh, this is a way of, it's a high-risk business, substantial fortunes are made. By the way, there's even today an Orthodox Jewish owner of a baseball team. The Getzler family owns the Staten Island Yankees, and they have a very good relationship with the Uber boss, George Steinbrenner, who permitted them to have the opening day of their baseball season a couple of years ago postponed from Friday night to Saturday night. So it's part of our history as well. I, to be honest with you, I don't deal with that aspect of Jews in sports, but it's a legitimate, legitimate topic. And I'm looking for the way we can use sports in so many different ways to understand American Jewish history, and it's part of our entrepreneurial history as well. Ma'am, then I'll call on you. I'm one of the first persons. Yeah. Yeah. His name, yeah, okay. Great question. His name was Tamir Goodman, okay? And frankly, he, he played for Towson State for a year, and Towson State's in the Baltimore area. A couple points about Tamir Goodman. Number one, no single person occupies more pages in that book than the Tamir Goodman story because he was the fulfillment of a Orthodox Jewish fantasy. I gave a paper that's based on the book at Creighton University, it's a Catholic institution in Omaha, Nebraska, called Tamir Goodman, American Sports Media and the Fantasy World of Orthodox Jews, namely, that a kid would be so good that the world would turn itself upside down to accommodate him. The basic storyline is the following. He went to the Baltimore Talmudical Academy, and in his junior year, there were some discussions of him getting a grant in aid to play at the University of Maryland under Gary Williams, who's the head coach there, okay? With the understanding they wouldn't have to play on the Sabbath, that he'd have kosher food. The Lubavitch movement stepped to the plate and said they provide him religious training as he went on down Tobacco Road to play in the ACC uh, Atlantic Coast Conference. The problem was, at the end of the game, end of the day, he wasn't that good a ball player. In fact, we at Yeshiva have the Red Sarachek Invitational. We bring in 18 Jewish schools from around the country. He came in. He played a 10 a.m. preliminary game. We had 1,100 fans. Our trustees were fighting with our rabbis for tickets to see this kid, Tamir Goodman. Bottom line was, he really wasn't that good. And at the end of the day, the University of Maryland said to him, son, you can come to our university, play. So he went to Towson State for a year and played and did so-so, also Division I. The next year, a new coach came in, didn't like his game. He left the, left the school and went to Israel, where he played on a third-level team, and he's no longer playing basketball. I, I feel in many respects it's a very sad story. Well, let me put it this way. If Chaim Potok had written this as a novel, it would have been a great novel, ambitious, coach, his coach, uh, naive kid, parents don't understand the situation, but the bottom line is, and I must tell you as now a bit of a basketball coach, when I watched Goodman playing, it was almost heresy within the Orthodox community to say a discouraging word about him. Even when he dropped out of his high school and played for a Seventh-day Adventist school, they also don't play Friday nights, to upgrade his game, he played there for a year. The only Jewish media outlet 
that criticized him was this great Jewish newspaper called The Village Voice, which said, what's going on here? But it touched, see, Gary Williams, a coach of Maryland, what, what did he understand? This is another kid he's recruiting. Didn't realize how this touched a nerve within the Orthodox, and, and I show in the book, larger Jewish community, that he was the fulfillment of this sort of great fantasy that, bottom line, he wasn't that good. And just one last point as a coach of yeshiva, he wasn't that great a player, but let's assume for a moment that he was as great as the clipping said he was. Tony Kornheiser, Washington Post, called him the Jewish Jordan, the Lubavitch Laker, the Celtic uh, Hasid, all these terms were used, okay? Let's say he was all that good. Had he come to yeshiva and take us to a national championship, that's an alternate way of proceeding. We might even beat NYU if we played. This gentleman coached at NYU, coached against us a few years ago. Um, many years ago. We both age rapidly. Uh, in any event, remarkable story about how he represented an image of someone who could be so good that the world would do uh, somersaults. Bottom line is he just wasn't a good at basketball player. Sir. Oh, well, Art, Art Heyman, we were discussing him, but Art Heyman, I think in 1964, 65, was a player of the year for Duke. And Lenny Rosenbluth played for North Carolina, I believe the team that beat Will Chamberlain for Kansas, okay? They were, they were, they were great, Jewish basketball, great Jewish basketball players. But again, in pursuit of their goal of being great players, their level of identification as Jews was minimal. Frankly, my book really doesn't deal much with identifying, identifying um, great Jewish sports figures, more looking at um, really how a foreign culture phenomenon called, called sports um, enters into the lives of Jews and the variety of conflicts that ensue in trying to be both Jewish and playing sports, uh, ranging from you know these professional athletes even to uh, looking at how Hasidic Jews uh, have some interest in sports. Uh, one of the next stops on my tour in September is so I was invited to Wartburg College in Iowa. I didn't know where Wartburg was, but I'm going out there. It's northern Iowa. They have a book project every year where the entire community reads a book to sensitize people to cultural diversity. So the book they chose for 2006 I'd love to say they chose my book. They didn't choose my book. They chose The Chosen by Chaim Potok. If you remember the opening scene of The Chosen, what do you have? A baseball game between the Hasidim and the modern Orthodox Jews. And I'm going to Wartburg to keynote their discussion of how you can begin to understand how Jews live in America by looking at the phenomenon of sports. Jeff? After that, he became uh, the maitre d' at a very popular restaurant on the Upper West Side called Carmine's. Uh, are you familiar with the story? No, oh, no. Okay. Carmine's is an Italian restaurant, very big, very famous on the Upper West Side. But if it's a good story, I'll use it on tour. Go ahead, yeah. Okay. So I walked in there. I'm, I'm not the coach of that. I'm not the room. I walk in there. He just retired and moved down to Florida. But what's on the wall? Two pictures of Sam Stern and his yeshiva in his Shiva basketball uniform playing basketball. So here you have in a very popular Upper West Side Italian restaurant, two, pi a picture, two pictures of a Yeshiva basketball player on, on the wall. Now I wonder, you know, 50 years ago, if they'd ever put a Yeshiva basketball player on the wall anywhere. Uh, in many synagogues, that's for sure. Yeah, that's yeah, but not in an Italian, in right. an Italian restaurant on the Upper West Side. Uh, two, just with Tamir Goodman, 
This is something that uh, I was talking about over there. I'm not sure if you were aware. Tamir Gubin's actually not the first Orthodox Jew or Yeshiva graduate to actually play Division One basketball. This kid in the mid '70s by the name of Aaron Grandison. Name right? Okay, you're right now. Everybody talks about Tamir Goodman, but Grandison never, he was probably the better ball player until he got, at, until he got injured. That's what killed him. But he was a black Jew who graduated in yeshiva who played for Columbia. And at that time, Columbia, uh, the Ivy League, you couldn't play freshman ball. Uh, but he played freshman. I think he won his first team all freshman. Uh, when the, that, and that team was very, the, that, that year, the Ivy League was very good, that freshman team. Uh, and then injured his leg, and he just wasn't the ball player itself. But there are other examples of that, but the, the significance of the Goodman story was the, the putative offer that was made here, namely that the a, the a, there's even talk of the ACC post, you know much, how many millions of dollars involved in the ACC tournament, they postponing their final game to uh, accommodate his religious needs. One last story, if I may, because I know I'm running late. Um, in doing this work on... Uh, on Goodman. I spoke to Jay Wright. Jay Wright is now the coach at Villanova. Took his team to the, the I guess, the Big Eight or... Uh, no, it's the Big Eight. No, no, no the, 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 yeah, the Elite Eight, right, this year. Well, he was coaching at Hofstra. And I asked him, how did you feel, he was in the same league with Townsend State. How did you feel about adjusting your schedule to meet Tommy Goodman's proclivities? Because Townsend State accommodated him. He said, well, I sort, of, I, I sort of felt bad for one of my own players named Lance Dunkley, a Mormon, who didn't ask for that sort of accommodation. And if you know basketball a couple of years ago, uh, the other university with the last name Y, Brigham Young, uh, asked the NCAA for permission not to play on Sunday their Sabbath. Very different world from uh, chariots of fire, where the religious hero is not a Jew, but the uh, not Harold Abrams, but I keep forgetting his name. But you know the the missionary who will not run on the uh, on the Sabbath. Anyway, I hope you enjoy it. I hope you'll buy the book. I hope you'll enjoy it. And thank you very much. You've been a very good audience. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y, New York, and all of our programs please visit us at 92ny.org.